All right, shall we begin? Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar on Joining Forces of Data Science and the Exposome. This is the fifth webinar in the Exposomics webinar series from the Human Health Exposure Analysis Resource Program. My name is Chris Duncan, and I'm a program administrator at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today, Dr. Arkot Rajasekhar and Dr. Sharad Patel. We'll be focusing on how we can leverage data science approaches to gain meaningful insights for exposomics data sets. There are so many complexities involved in the analysis of the exposome. The framework of the exposome comprises all the exposures to which an individual is subject, subjected to over a lifetime, including the physical, chemical exposures that a person experiences, where they live and work, where uh, what the person eats and what they do, the person's social experiences, as well as their corresponding biological responses. Thus, the exposomics data sets can be very large and diverse and originate from many different sources, creating many analytical and infrastructural re related changes. Today's talks will highlight strategies and methods at the intersection of data science and the exposome, including big data platforms, analytical approaches leveraging machine learning and deep learning, as well as other tools and approaches that can help us discover re relationships among phenotypes, biological responses, and exposures. Both of our speakers for today welcome your questions. So if you do have a question, please use the question and answer function on Zoom, and we'll do our best to address each of these after each of the talks. And we do have an option to raise hands to ask que questions as well, so that's available. With that in mind, let's move along to the presentations. Our first speaker is Dr. Arkot Rajasekhar. Raja is a professor at the UNC School of Information and Library Science. And he's also a chief scientist at the Re Renaissance Computing Institute. Raja received his doctorate in computer science from the U University of Maryland College Park. And before coming to UNC, he was at the San Diego Supercomputer Center at UCSD. Dr. Rajasekhar is a data architect who builds systems that data scientists can use so they can discover and analyze large-scale data sets. And he's a leading proponent of policy-oriented large-scale data management. Raja has been involved in research and development of data grid middleware systems for over a decade. And he's a lead originator behind the concepts in the storage resource broker and the integrated rule-oriented data systems. He has several research projects funded by the NSF, the National Archives, NIH, and other federal agencies. And he's been involved in many projects, including the DataNet Federation Consortium and DataBridge. Today, he'll be sharing his insights on the exposomics ecosystem. Welcome, Raja. You have the floor. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks for uh, the great introduction. Um, okay, today I'm going to talk about the ecosystems needed for performing um, exposomics. Um, so uh, let me start with uh, showing uh, uh, one of the, uh, um, uh, the NIHS has been holding a set of sequence of workshops over, over the summer um, on, on trying to see how accelerating precision and environmental health using the exposome can be done. And uh, these uh, um, a couple of months long, um, um, workshops have, have have given rise to a set of uh, ideas uh, which uh, uh, are were being explored and uh, they were called the clusters and I'm showing you here five clusters uh, of what what type of things uh, they came up uh, in this uh, in this set of uh, workshops uh, they looked at what to measure how to measure and how to share and harmonize data standards and ontologies, and how to integrate, analyze, and interpret these data, and how to translate uh, the findings from these things and, and uh, have an impact uh, in intervention and prevention. As you can see, uh, these are the topics that were de defined by uh, multitudes of researchers who were uh, a part of this particular uh, set of sequence of workshops. And uh, many of these workshops had more than 150 participants. And one of the things which came out of this particular uh, set of workshops is that the, the need for data science uh, as, a, as a way of performing uh, the next generation exposomics. Uh, exposomics is pretty young. 
He's only around 10 years old or 10 to 12 years old, but the, but the real work has been uh, done in the past uh, eight or nine years. Uh, and uh, it has done a lot of uh, uh, fantastic work and has, has laid a basic foundation, but take it to the next level. Uh, we need to um, bring out to see how large scale data management and large scale data analytics can be brought into it. And I've highlighted the, the type of things which, which, which are very important from a data science point of view uh, to take exosomics to the next level. Um, I am I am coming in as a data scientist, as like uh, Chris pointed out. I've been working um, in in large scale uh, data system uh, for for quite a long time, and uh, more importantly, I've been working with several domain scientists, um, uh, from seismologists to oceanographers to uh, uh, to hydrologists. Uh, to you, our neuroscience, uh, you name it, I have worked with multiple sets of people. And one of the things which all of these sciences need is a standard platform where they can run their systems and where, where new people who want to get into the system, uh, into the field are seasoned uh, and uh, um, professionals can want to uh, use use that particular one, having a set of tools is, is really important. And one of the things we are trying to promote in exposomics is try to see how we can build such an ecosystem for exposomics. So whenever we, we talk about uh, exposomics, uh, most of us talk about what is called internal exposomics, which is basically uh, using a lot of omics type of tools to do that. Uh, the other part of exposomics is the external exposomics, uh, where we are uh, bringing in exposure science uh, in there. But the part which is um, missing and which is probably needed to be promoted to, at the next level is try to do integrated and applied exposomics so that we can do translational science uh, to the next level so that whatever be the results we get from exposomics studies, we can take that and apply it and, and, and do that. And also integrate the, both the external exposomics and internal exposomics and add a whole bunch of different types of uh, uh, models and tools which are available from different sciences into that one. So you can see whenever you're trying talking about integrated exposomics, uh, we, we need to bring in uh, a lot of different tools uh, together to do that. And one of the best way to bring something like that is to, uh, is to develop an ecosystem for that. Um, as I say here, exposomics is at a cost source um, because not just that, that it, is, it, is at a, it, it has grown to a particular level where it, is, it can blossom into a larger science, but also that there are a lot of things that are happening where exosomics can be a good tool and a, and a good science to do that. When environmental changes are coming in and we need to measure, harmonize, and map uh, and these markers uh, along with the biomarkers, which we have been looking at um, in there. Uh, and it's becoming um, really crucial because of, of these these type of challenges. Uh, the grand challenge in exposomics, as I say, um, is with the with uh, with with the uh, need for a comprehensive platform so that we can take the pioneering studies which have already happened and integrate and operationalize that in exposomics into two parts. One is try to perform integrative exposomics by combining internal exposomics, external exposomics, along with the other um, sciences which can add to that. And similarly, we want to operationalize applied exposomics from the data collection to effective actions so that we can see how it can affect not only um, to provide uh, personalized medicine, but also um, uh, personalized public medicine type of thing. How can the community by itself um, be changed, be helped uh, using the exposomics as a, um, as a tool? Um, so to, to create such a uh, um, uh, exposomic ecosystem, uh, we can use the data science as the, uh, um, as the integration platform, um, as the integrator for that one, um, so that we can integrate uh, both the, uh, the wet sciences and the dry sciences coming from external factors and the wet sciences coming from the internal uh, exposomics, along with the, with the data science to, uh, to pull all of these together. And we look at three different challenges which we need to meet when building such an ecosystem. First is the data challenge, uh, where we would like to have a trusted clearinghouse for different types of data which can come in, uh, not only for sharing, um, but also so that you can take that and try to apply that and uh, use it in multiple purposes. Uh, the, the fair data principles are basically in there so that we can increase the reuse, we can make it more interoperable uh, for, for, for the larger community to, to take into account. 
Similarly, at the analytics challenge, uh, we, we would like to look at to see um, how we can link the different types of uh, uh, analysis which are happening and the synthesis which are happening in there, integrating the models and the maps from other sciences uh, and uh, applying um, small and big data analytics, including machine learning um, uh, is, is, is becoming going to be a challenge. And workflows are needed and pipelines are needed so that you can, you can create these things. These are many of the studies and many of the uh, algorithms which are needed to do are not very really simple. Uh, they are very complex and, and, and take uh, uh, different types of uh, computing systems to perform. Uh, so having a pipeline uh, which can do that automatically becomes really useful, not only for, for, for doing the experiments, but also for testing and retesting and replaying those type of experiments uh, on the long term with multiple communities. And we can also, because of analytic challenge is that, um, uh, what can we do with prediction, how we can uh, use what is called artificial exposomics uh, with synthetic populations in there. And finally, the, the uh, probably one of the most important challenges uh, is the people challenge. Um, how do we bring people together um, to do uh, the exposomic studies and exposomic experiments in there? Um, like uh, the field is so young that the very first uh, a journal is just being launched um, in, in, in this particular field um, in there. So since it is a very young field, it is very easy to bring people together and, and try to define the best practices that everybody needs to follow in there. So we can define the templates to do that and, and, and also uh, provide that as a training. Exposomic science is not taught in any, any schools at all, uh, in, in a sense. So uh, trying to bring a curriculum for that and trying to educate uh, undergrad students and, and not only uh, researchers um, to do that is, is becoming, uh, will be a really important part of it. And a community of practice will be something which will help in, in, uh, in doing that. And one of, the, one of the items where a community of practice will be very useful, uh, where we can use citizen sciences, uh, scientists and smart communities to do that. Not only as a place where we can uh, apply exposomics and, and, and study uh, the, the concept of exposomics in a larger community, but also to make them part of the experiments which we are uh, performing in here. So we want to define and develop an exposomic ec ecosystem uh, to provide the needed infrastructure to solve such a grand challenge. So let's look at each of these uh, different challenges uh, which we need to do. Uh, um, the, the data challenge is that um, there are a lot of data being created. Uh, I think uh, the, the data clearing house in the uh, is is uh, one of the places where uh, people are depositing some of the data. But whenever we look at exposomics, it is not just the labs which are creating this data, but there are a lot of other data which need to be integrated into it. Um, uh, data from the EPA um, need to be federated, may not be part of the, uh, this one, but can be part of the clearing house so that you can get a uh, one shop uh, where you can go to a portal, you'll be able to get data from multiple different sites uh, within a seamless fashion uh, to do that. Uh, so the export data um, of providing a federated exposomics data platform uh, is a needed part of the ecosystem. Uh, and apart from that, uh, I think uh, uh, there are tools which are needed to be um, uh, done, uh, which will be very helpful uh, um, to uh, for, for meeting the data challenge. One is, um, since exposomics is, is a highly uh, spatio-temporal oriented, it, it changes with time and it changes with uh, location, uh, we would like to see how we can use that particular type of geo uh, coding um, uh, to be useful uh, so that we can see how exposures can affect a uh, large uh, range of people and species uh, themselves. Uh, one of the important things about this integrated exposomics is that you need to collect data and uh, collecting data from wearables, mobile uh, uh, sensor systems and stationary sensor systems and, and including um, drones type of things and uh, applying some of the computing at the edge, edge itself um, becoming are, are becoming really important. There are uh, projects such as the Sage uh, project in Chicago, or the uh, or the AQ project, air quality project in in Baltimore, and 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 the projects in in California are all very very uh, collecting data in a particular way. But all those data are 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 not easily available uh, for an exposome uh, exposomics researcher to do that. So get the data and integrate the data 
along with 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 the with the data which is uh, which is being done by the NIHS labs type of thing uh, will be an important part of it. Uh, one of the things which was emphasized even in the in the three day workshop which is just ending um, in uh, at NIHS is that uh, a markup language or ontology development is uh, definitions is really needed. Uh, uh, since this science is very young, um, um, there are very few uh, definitions and very few uh, types of uh, um, uh, ontological uh, definitions which are available and providing that will be very helpful as we go into the next level. The analytical ch challenges, um, like Chris pointed out, uh, a lot of data is being collected. So there is a big data analytics needs to be involved. It can be the um, machine learning and AI type of thing, um, like a neural network and CNN and ANN and so on. But it, it also needs a normal um, bread and butter predictive analytics is also very much needed into there. And one of the big challenges is that we are dealing with different types of data uh, coming in uh, from, from different uh, levels. Uh, it can be um, both uh, image data and, uh, and also data, uh, say, 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 coming uh, from, um, uh, from different instruments. And you would like to uh, pull them together uh, from across multiple disciplines and, and, uh, and, and provide a framework for doing that. So the analytic challenge is the multimodal data, uh, which need to be integrated into the into the system. Uh, to do that, you you need an integrated data model um, and pipelines, which can be easily assembled. Uh, so you want to have well, what I call as plug and play systems. So you need to have a different types of microservices, which you can basically chain them together to achieve a larger goal type of thing. So developing those microservices for exposomics and then making them available will be really useful. So we, we have a whole bunch of tools which are, which are generic, which is being useful, but as we go towards a particular type of things, uh, like, like the BLAST uh, type of things, uh, we need to develop uh, those uh, uh, different microservices which are needed uh, and, and make it part of an expo, expo bench, I will, I will call it, uh, so that anybody can come in and use it uh, in a particular way and, and, and it will be, uh, something which 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 they can be rely on um, to do that. Mm. And again, uh, we talked about uh, XWAS uh, uh, and, 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 and an exposomic wide area um, um, uh, exposomic wide anal an analysis. And when we whenever whenever we are talking uh, like that, we are talking about um, a lot of uh, different uh, different scales of operations um, in there, and uh, we need to uh, share that um, with 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 people the, how how the analysis was was done and how the synthesis was done. And these computational pipeline uh, need to be part of uh, uh, these uh, things which are available so that other people can take advantage of that. Um, other, other thing which uh, analytic challenge is also that exposomics is, is going to be a very rich uh, science. Um, and uh, trying to make sense of that is going to be very hard. So we need to develop what, what are called semantic integration of these exosomics data so that uh, we can pull them together. Knowledge graphs are becoming important uh, on the, in, in from, uh, the importance of uh, uh, semantic uh, uh, tags are, are, uh, have been, uh, are, seen, are seen as, um, uh, as, as one of the breakthroughs. And actually uh, NSF has been funding this for the past few years and, and, re uh, and recently put out a um, roadmap for how they're going to um, build the knowledge information uh, system for doing that. And I think since, uh, since exposomics is, is at, a, at, a, at, a, at a very good, very good uh, point of departure, um, we, the, the development of the knowledge graph uh, will be an important uh, analytical challenge, uh, which, which we need to be met. Obviously people are really important um, as part of the thing. And uh, the, uh, we need to uh, pull, pull people together, uh, bring, bring, the, bring their ideas and methods and policies um, together um, to do that. And as a young science, uh, people are now working um, in their own uh, smaller silos and pulling them together so that they can share and, uh, and, and be uh, a part of the standardization effort uh, is, is really important um, in there. And it's also in, important for, um, as, a, as a place uh, for mentoring uh, students, um, both at the level of uh, uh, undergraduate students and graduate students, and I suspect also at the level of high school students uh, will, be, will be possible. Because uh, exposomics is, is so hands-on 
uh, type of things we can do, uh, it becomes really helpful to, to do that. And uh, with, with deeper sensor systems and, and microcontrollers and things like that, uh, involving um, uh, the, and the high school students uh, is, 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 is becoming really a, a very good possibilities with a very low uh, outlay of money to do that. Uh, obviously, um, getting the decision makers and policy makers uh, into that and transfer of technology and uh, having uh, industrial support are all also part of uh, uh, such a uh, community of practice, we can bring them together. Uh, one, another big uh, um, one about, uh, about uh, uh, exposomics is that it is a citizen science. It is not a normal uh, science which only some of the practitioners can do, like, like in medical science and things like that. Here, uh, citizen science can play, a, scientists can play a big role um, in, in doing that. And uh, of course, and the uh, exposomics community of practice can actually help in fostering and mentoring uh, a very healthy environment for for, for citizens to, to take part in uh, exposomic experiments and even conduct some of the experiments uh, and bring their results back to, to do that. And, and the concept of smart and connected communities become, become um, really important. And with, uh, with the IoT, uh, Internet of Things, um, we, 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 um, we, we should also look at Internet of Exposomics um, type of things, which can, which can be brought into uh, in here so that uh, uh, we, can, we can take the um, system on the science to the next level. Uh, crowdsourcing and developing and deploying uh, applications and sensors uh, can be a really uh, good part of such a system. So how do we go about doing it? Uh, here I'm, I'm throwing up a, uh, um, uh, what I call as a uh, ERC, um, in your exposomic research cycle of how does a uh, one particular type of experiment can be done um, involving citizen science and involving uh, uh, the data science and uh, large scale, uh, uh, um, um, uh, what do you call, uh, um, um, uh, analytical uh, systems, both, both in the wet lab and in the dry lab type of thing um, can, be, uh, can be done. And you, you can bring in exposure uh, science in there, precision health in there, and uh, and lifestyles uh, to be to be to be part of it. Um, so uh, we can gather a lot of data uh, and take the data and do some uh, data mining and uh, model building, and then apply that uh, uh, into into a map and uh, use that to perform longitudinal studies or or derive an act and 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 try to figure out uh, how we can uh, um, uh, promote healthy living. Uh, using using uh, using that, so applying the data science um, as as one of the tools uh, in exposomics becomes uh, really important. And this is the type of things which has been promoted by Jim Gray, uh, who is the who is the father of uh, one of the fathers of of large scale computing. And uh, he says that the 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 deluge of data which is which we are going, which are going through uh, needs a new way of looking at things. And uh, and data science. Um, and data scientists are going to play a bigger role in, in almost all of the domain sciences in there. And uh, these are the type of uh, um, uh, what do you call ERCs or exosomic research cycles. Um, this is one sample of it, but we can we can talk about uh, for a different type of experiment, uh, you might have a, a different set of uh, things which are, which are happening in there, uh, which we can study. But, but formulating and, and ten templates for that will be very useful. Um, and here I throw out, uh, throw throw an uh, reference exosomics uh, ecosystem, basically based on what I talked before the the ERC uh, as well as the the different three three different challenges uh, and and trying to pull them together uh, in data um, mappings and, uh, and 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 trying to um, use uh, sensors uh, for community community friendly sensors uh, for doing. Um, uh, gathering data and and so on. Uh, I think I'll 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 stop here. Um, basically, building such an ecosystem is not a uh, one one uh, one small uh, uh, set of people. It needs a whole community to 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 build um, these type of things. Uh, it needs input from them. It needs uh, um, um, what 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 type of things are needed and the tools which they have developed to be integrated to the system. And there are multiple tools which are being developed uh, for the exposomics community and integrating them into one ecosystem is going to be a good challenge. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Raja. That was an excellent talk. This is truly a multifaceted grand challenge, as you mentioned, and a very exciting, very timely talk here. <coughs> and uh, just as a reminder, uh, please uh, ask your questions through the question and answer box. Or if you prefer, we do have an option to raise your hand to ask questions as well. We have time for one or two questions and uh, we do have one in the Q&A box, so if you all don't mind, I'll pose that right now. So Raja, how can we deal with measurement, error, measurement errors and misclassification from exposomic data? I'm afraid these issues may lead to seriously biased results compared with single exposure data, rather than capturing comprehensive exposure pictures. So I, measurement I agree. errors and misclassification. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, um, errors uh, from from um, any any type of sensors um, is going to be a very big problem. Uh, it can be a sensor uh, which is uh, doing a blood sampling, or it can be a sensor which is doing a water uh, sampling, and uh, they can creep into. It, and we need to be very careful about that. And uh, developing sensors uh, which are uh, having um, some sort of uh, um, uh, a, a level of uh, 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 that, that you, you can confidence in them uh, needs to be needs to be developed. Currently, a lot of sensors are, are available, um, but uh, some of them are are, are not um, um, providing us with uh, with with really uh, uh, what do you call a, a good level of confidence in them. Uh, trying to promote industry because this is not a single person can develop these sensors. Uh, to industries to, to develop uh, uh, sensors of high quality uh, needs to be done. I think one way of, uh, of uh, taking, uh, uh, taking this challenge and solving this challenge is to make sure that we develop uh, really good instruments. The medical field uh, went, went into that uh, compared to the earlier times, the, the type of uh, equipment which are and, uh, and uh, sensitivity they have in there um, are are highly regulated, and uh, you don't you don't get a uh, equipment out into the uh, out into practice uh, unless it has been uh, gone through all um, uh, all the tests and uh, and has been approved. I think uh, we need to have such an approval type of thing uh, so that we can take these uh, uh, sensors uh, data to do that, and and having something that will be part of the community of practice. Uh, to do that. Uh, one of the things is to make sure that we are getting uh, sensors um, that are up to the mark. Good points. Thank you, Raja. Yeah. In the interest of time, let's go ahead and move to our next speaker, Dr. Sharag Patel. Dr. Patel is an associate professor of biomedical informatics at Harvard Medical School. He received his doctorate in biomedical informatics from Stanford University, and his long-term research goal is to solve problems in human health and disease by developing computational and bioinformatics methods to reproducibly and efficiently reason over high-throughput data streams spanning molecules to populations. Sharab's group has several ongoing research projects that are uncovering connections between the environment, genes, and health, including projects funded by NIEHS, NIA, NIAID, as well as the NSF. Through this work, Dr. Patel aims to dissect inter-individual differences in human phenomes through strategies that integrate multiple complex data sources that capture the clinical experience, the environmental exposures, and the inherited genomic variation. And this group also develops some exciting computer-intensive approaches to make findings more robust and to accelerate meta-science. Really cool work. So today he's gonna to be speaking on leveraging biobank scale to prioritize exposure phenotype associations. Welcome Sharag and take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Duncan. I'm just gonna make sure that you all can hear me okay. Um, Loud and clear. Great, great. And um, thank you Raja also for your fantastic talk. I, I So my talk is a primarily an applications-based talk about how we can use this data, but um, you know, you have to appreciate how much time, effort, and resources it takes to stitch all these data together. Uh, as a lot of the work that you guys are uh, on, on this talk, uh, on this uh, seminar series are dealing with. So um, I very much appreciate the things that uh, uh, will come out of your, your system. All right. Um, 
Uh, so our primary substrate of our research work is, is uh, biobank data. So we think of the All of Us study, you think of lifelines in the Netherlands, you think of the UK biobank, you think of the Kaduri biobank. And um, my higher part, hypothesis here is that it's possible to use data science methods uh, to find new and established exposures associated with health in, in biobank data. Uh, it, I think it's, it, it's just quick to, to notice some of these characteristics of these, of these convenient samples or that they're observational, of course, they're usually non-randomized um, by definition. Uh, a convenient samples, uh, individuals self-select themselves to be a part of them for the most part. Um, there's exception to the All of Us study where there's a, a sampling-based structure. Uh, they're a single cohort and a lot of them come without a hypothesis, that is without a specific disease or exposure factor to study. This is a bit of a contrast with uh, our, the HERE resources, HERE resource, which is a very important resource for the exposome community that attempts to aggregate multiple cohorts that are also observational to, to ask very cohort specific um, hypotheses or to aggregate across these cohorts to uh, meta analyze and, and increase power. But I do think that methods from uh, use of biobanks can certainly uh, inform uh, our, our experiences with, with the HERE repository and, and vice versa. So one critical uh, win for biobank data, which I hope uh, in, in, in the next 10, 20 years we can see come to fruition with the exposome sciences, is that the genomics have been um, enhanced by biobanks and, not, and it's a, a catapulted by a biobank. So not just in research efficiency, which I'm showing here on the left by the number of publications, by, by the number of discoveries, by the number of replications we've been able to make, we the community, uh, not me in particular, a uh, way we can communicate across cohorts by doing meta-analyses, discovering of new biological pathways and figuring out what factors are uh, confounding our, 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 our associations, which I think are pretty much at, still at large with exposomics related studies. I, I think uh, we still need to evaluate all of these items to see if we, uh, can achieve this type of paradigm shift that genomics have, have received um, in, in, with the emergence of biobank data. I would say that where the promise lies are uh, potential for assessing stability, uh, for example, uh, across cohort, disease, place, and time, uh, multiplicity, developing standards for reporting in large cohort data where there's multiple variables that we need to scan through, uh, figuring out correlation structure of, the, of mixtures, engage them in figure out their implication in, in, with respect to uh, connections to disease. Measure biological plausibility. So often these cohorts uh, or these samples are linked to biological samples where then we can interrogate uh, biological implications of the exposome. So what's turned on and off uh, omically, if you will, uh, due to exposure. And uh, facilitate collaboration. And this is something that uh, I think that here is hoping to provide is ways of harmonizing across cohorts for meta-analysis and synthesis and to address things like stability, the first bullet point. Okay, so what's in our, uh, what's in our current toolbox to uh, tackle the complexity? I'd say that existing tools like statistical machine learning, figuring out what exposome variables are associated with a phenotype, like in a variable selection exercise, development and evaluation of risk scores, figuring out if things are actually translatable. Do we do better than, than clinical scores, for example? Assessing correlation, the complex correlation be, uh, between uh, exposures and mixtures and uh, deconvolving that with sociodemographic factors, for example. Um, and the tools of data science, you know, for example, testing robustness and stability of findings using sensitivity analyses or vibration of effects, something I'll talk about a little later today. Um, and enhancing compatibility between cohort data. I think this is a big, big deal uh, to enable us to triangulate and replicate across different cohorts and potentially doing some leveraging uh, deep learning techniques. So these are new tools in AI to assess complex exposome data like many of you on this call are doing right now for exposures, but you can also do this for, uh, for phenotype as well. And I'll show an example of that uh, later today too. Um, so first, assessing stability of replacing time. Um, so for the first thing that we need to understand or, or uh, to assess the role of exposome and disease is, is figure out the role of shared and non-shared. And so when we think of share, we think of like things that we're sharing in our household or in our zip code and non-shared, you know, it could be things that we don't share within a household. So for example, if my partner and I disperse later in the day and consume different uh, 
uh, lunches, for example, that would be an example of a, of a non-shared uh, type of exposure. So you can break it down into like a, a very bio or epi 101 type of equation where we can write down phenotypes, gen genetics, and exposures um, in, in a simple equation here. Uh, and then you know, break apart its variation to kind of dissect the role of genetics in shared environment. And, and so the geneticists have been doing this for a while, and this is a term kind of like an AUC or R squared for genetics. It's the heritability, the proportion of genetics that you could, uh, that you can, uh, uh, that uh, you can explain for a particular phenotype and the ratio between the two varies from zero to one. And a quantity that uh, exposomics uh, uh, should embrace are both C squared and the difference between C squared and the re rest of the variation. That's the shared variation that might come from household that's not due to genetics uh, in the total phenotypic variation. Again, it's ranges from zero to one and how it's assessing like an R squared, how much variation we can ascribe to the shared exposome. And so to do this, we used a uh, convenient, another type of administrative set of data um, and not exactly a convenience data source, but it's a all comers type of data source that in insurance claims data set. And we matched that up where, with where people lived uh, with things like weather, air pollution and, and socioeconomic status. So classically like uh, uh, the classic environmental epidemiology studies uh, uh, that have taken place. The, 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 the added benefit here of using a data set such as this one is that to assess G and shared E, you need G and shared E measured in the same place. And to do that, what we did was to get where, how uh, people related to one another is looked at individuals' uh, family relationships, uh, for example, twin status. And so out of these types of data, you, you could get, you know, here we got 60,000 twin pairs out of a, a large cohort of over um, 10 million or so. And it, it provided a nice place to do a natural experiment of sorts to get, uh, uh, to get family relationships. The next largest collection of twins uh, were about 30,000. Uh, so then you could play this, uh, this analytic technique where you could partition out the role of genetics by knowing how people were related to one another genetically by no, and also knowing how people are related to one another uh, it, it, with, with respect to their shared exposome, where they live. And so essentially we do this mapping technique. Um, again, this is a, a technique that many of you are probably undergoing in your studies where you assess where people live via their zip code and do this trick, taking the nearest neighbor or some sort of other function to assess their air quality and levels of uh, uh, pollution, uh, the seasonality or temperature variation, and even associate deprivation index by using census data. And, and, and so that's what we did. And we, we mashed it up with, uh, with the twin status to partition the role of heritability, which is the HR, total genetic variation, shared environment, which is C squared, uh, and try to look at the ways that C squared could be broken down into socioeconomic, area level socioeconomic status, air quality, and temperature. And so on the left-hand side, I'm showing, uh, um, both of these plots are showing two examples. One is Lyme disease, which is a, it's a complex trait as we, we would think about it, but not so much genetics, but a lot of shared environmental variation. And that's the red bar there. And of that shared environment, you know, seasonality plays a huge role. Like, uh, for example, people going out in the summer, um, getting exposed to, uh, uh, to ticks and, and bugs of sorts and getting exposed to Lyme disease. Obesity, another complex trait, um, also uh, a large amount of genetics, about 50 to 60% from our GWAS studies, which we're able to show here too, but huge part in the United States of a shared environmental basis. So where you live might also be correlated with, uh, with obesity. And of that shared environment, area level socioeconomic status plays a large part as, as, as well as you see in the purple, purple downstairs uh, down below. And then you could look at these traits in, 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 in mass at scale. And that's another benefit of using these types of biobank types of uh, samples is that you can look at not at one or two or three different phenotypes, but uh, multiple to try to help you triangulate evidence uh, for different uh, phenotypes and exposures of interest. So here, what we're showing here is like when you decompose the shared environment, what's the role of the total temperature variation or socioeconomic variation or air quality on the right-hand side. And so what you're, you're seeing here is on that same scale of variation, uh, how, what per percent of total variation can you explain with socioeconomic status? So things like morbid obesity and obesity is a little over uh, two to 3% on, on, the, uh, uh, on the left, uh, very strong p-value. So, uh, so that's what you're seeing on the, on the y-axis, so negative log 10 p-value. 
On the right-hand side is air quality. So things like influenza and respiratory infections are also strong AQI variance components in terms of their p-values, a little modest in terms of the total um, variation explained. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, but knowing now the the route some of the route of exposure from things like COVID, um, it was it was something that uh, I, I had come to appreciate after seeing a plot like this, where I really was like, wow, I don't really believe this information. But now it, it seems like it's coming to to uh, uh, be uh, replicated in, in other traits such as such as COVID nineteen. So you can start to the the main idea here is you can start to break apart where we might live with respect to genetics and uh, other indicators of environment and, and put them on the same scale to assess how they might all together contribute to total phenotypic variation in the population. But long story short, if you build a database like this, you could see that a lot of variation is yet to be explained. So total amount of genetic variations, 30% and shared environments, 10%. So there leaves a lot of variation ex to explain across all these 560 phenotypes that are measured in the real world. So where does that uh, align? And I think that's where the, another win for biobanks could happen and, and data sets like here is that now you can start testing individual exposures to see what their role is in, in, in explaining that uh, missing variation. And so um, exposed on wide association studies will help us ca counter multiplicity, um, both defeating it and, and dealing with it. And, development of predictive algorithms. So here's an example of how we did this and also in, in the UK Biobank where we took a, a Yishuan took a, a bunch of modifiable um, and not so modifiable exposures. You used a exposure wide approach to, to prioritize and then started selecting indiv individual um, modifiable factors and non-modifiable uh, non-genetic factors to see if she could build a predictive model. And yes, she could. Um, and so the next question was, uh, how, how does it compare to the existing polygenic risk scores that our, uh, our neighbors are so fond of using in, in complex diseases? By the way, it, it beats it very handily. And how well does it do with clinical risk, risk scores? So it's a, probably an intermediary before using the clinical risk. And that's what's being shown here, a 0.84 C statistic versus a 0.76 versus for a poly exposure score. So this quantity also ranges from zero to one, one being the highly most highly predictive and zero, and I'm sorry, 0.5 being essentially random chance. And so you're doing a little poorly than the clinical risk score, but can you help me predict if I had a clinical risk score for an individual? And lo and behold, uh, using a metric called the, um, uh, the reclassification index, you can ask the question, uh, given a particular clinical phenotype of an individual, a clinical risk score, can I better predict those who had been wrongly predicted by the clinical risk score using a poly exposure score uh, in, in tandem? And lo and behold, yes, you can, and you can to such a degree that uh, 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 um, that it might be clinically uh, impactful. For for example, uh, this this particular poly exposure score could have could predict uh, uh, a better than chance individuals who had not had a chance to be diagnosed with diabetes, who had undiagnosed diabetes, for example, had high levels of uh, of glucose, uh, or um, and and did not had not been diagnosed at, at, at the point of care just yet. Also the polygenic risk score, which are data not shown here could add noise, um, if, for example, and, and be actually um, uh, detract from uh, uh, predicting individuals uh, or reclassifying individuals correctly. For that, check out that Elliott paper I just flashed up. Also the, the exposome is densely correlated with one another. And so we need ways of kind of uh, devising experiments to assess and contextualize this dense correlation. Here's an example from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey where we just plotted the correlations between different exposures and, and visualize them in a globe such as this one. And uh, the lines I hope make you appreciate the correlations between the different exposures along the exposome. Uh, but the sheer amount of them are, are immense. There are a lot of correlations that are between uh, different pairwise uh, uh, of exposures. And what does this actually mean in terms of prediction or in terms of uh, figuring out what exposures are causing what? Uh, so this is a project that Tom evaluated and looked at dense exposure variables and said, how interchangeable might they be or how might they affect our prediction if we consider these correlations? Um, 
and how can we contextualize them? So what does all this mean? I'll explain in a second here. So, but what he did was he took another biobank sample, lifelines in the Netherlands, about 100,000 individuals, follow them up and assess diabetes at the end. He did a similar approach to Yishwin where basically threw all these exposures into a, into a model, split up the data set and did a lasso based regression to select variables that were strongly associated with phenotype. And lo and behold, found many variables, both clinically related and environmental exposures associated with uh, long-term outcomes for diabetes. You're not going to assimilate all of these um, yet, but what I could tell you is that things like physical activity, PM, a, um, a drug, a, um, a pharmaceutical drug use, family history, we're all connected, uh, strongly connected with, with diabetes but they're all correlated with one another. So what does this mean in terms of prediction? So he asked a couple of different questions as he asked the question, if we were to make the strong claim that they're causal, now that's very strong. Not all of these are gonna be causal. Most of them might not be, but you can ask the question, how do the effects compare? How do their hazard ratios compare? And so you could a, a, a scale them all similarly and ask how many no standard deviations are needed to it be equivalent to the standard of care, or for example, the change of a unit of body mass index, for example. So what's plotted here on the x-axis is the number of additional standard deviations you need to be equivalent to, for example, a change of one standard deviation in, in body mass index. Um, so what it comes to is that if for things that are environmental in nature or behavioral, uh, things like PM 2.5 and or um, and smoking and things like that, you would need a three to six additional standard deviations on top of the one uh, um, uh, uh, compared to something like a body mass index, which would in, in the United States, what this would in, be equivalent to is essentially moving out from the, the deep south where you have strong uh, PM 2.5 exposures to somewhere like, uh, uh, like the, the Northeast where PM might be a little bit lower. So a huge gross uh, geographic shift to be equivalent to a one BMI, one unit of BMI. Another thing is that some of these variables, because they're so correlated with one another, they show small additive predictions. So you have what is being shown here on the left-hand side is a prediction accuracy for the versus the number of variables that you include in your model uh, for different types of variables. And you, you know, what I would hope that you appreciate is that you max out at a very small number of variables just because those variables are, 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 are encompassing the signal from the other 137 or so variables that are correlated with, with the phenotype. So you see these jumps up to the, of the C index, uh, no matter what model you use to a very quick saturation of that prediction and then that peaks out. So the many documented or to be discovered environmental, individual level environmental variables may show very small additive, additive prediction because things are, are very strongly correlated with one another. I think another win is trying to assess biological plausibility and or new biological pathways associated with disease. So I our group is very interested in type two diabetes of which age is a strong predictor. And so Alan uh, in my group asked the question, can we predict age as a function of uh, pancreatic and liver MRI images? and see if those are correlated with, with disease. And so he used this deep learning technique where he took MRIs from the UK Biobank that are assessed on the abdomen, liver, and pancreas. He asked the question, could you predict age? And lo and behold, he could. He had a mean absolute error of about 3.5 years. And so with that age prediction, he asked the question, okay, can I figure out who's accelerated and who's decelerated based on the, uh, on the deep learning predictor? And then those who are, uh, you could then you could ask the question: What exposures or genetic factors are correlated with accelerated or or decelerated age? Um, and so that's what we did. So Alan then performed a genome-wide association study, found finding multiple signals that were correlated with things like diabetes and BMI um, a, and cancer in accelerated aging of different uh, uh, of different a, uh, uh, tissues MRIs. But important for us is that we found multiple factors that were correlated with things uh, such as uh, with accelerated or decelerated aging. So here on the on the on the x is the correlation, and y is the negative log ten p value, and x was of sorts against accelerated aging, and found that things like physical activity, smoking, and alcohol, good old factors that we know uh, very well uh, 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 regarding their relationships with complex traits seem to also impact accelerated age. So it leads us to the question of, 
you know, where do this, where does this fit in? Does it fit in as an independent uh, factor in terms of diabetes? That is, it affects accelerated aging, which then affect maybe things like diabetes, or is this happening in, in parallel in, in, uh, for individuals? Um, so lifestyle exposure, exposure is shared between aging and diabetes. What comes first? Are they independent? I think uh, new promises um, involve uh, assaying in a different way. So we could do exposures that are moved beyond you know, the, 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 the typical lifestyle exposures that we consider. And here, Jake Chung is, is proposing a way uh, to assess exposures using um, ligand receptor binding, a, a biological assay to get closer to, uh, to, to causality or closer to that uh, functional exposure that might uh, induce response. So the idea might be you have something like accelerated or decelerated aging, you also have blood, can you use these functional assays to, to entangle what exposures, broadly speaking, beyond lifestyle might be correlated with, with disease. I think in, in biobanks, another issue might be uh, that I mentioned is that they're observational and it's their, the, the, the confounding structure is not as well known as it, as it is in genetics. So you have confounding, you have reverse causality, you have a lot of missing information. And so to deal with this, I would say that one approach might be sensitivity analyses and meta-analyses across different cohorts to see if your, your, uh, your findings are in fact replicated. This is uh, very well charted out um, by many, many P uh, uh, folks. Uh, here's a nice perspective on it from Muin Corey and John Ioannidis. So one idea might be is to ask the question, which variables are, are robust to the study designs that you might use, like the variables that you choose in your analytical model. So here, Braden in our group leverage a tool called vibration of effects or idea called vibration effects and try to make this happen. He's that, he asked the question, if I throw all these different models at a, a particular question, um, a DAG notwithstanding, which ones seem to stand the test of time across all these different uh, models? So for example, you have cases and controls as shown here on the left-hand side, you might have different ways of representing your, the causal model for that particular uh, association. And you throw all of it into the into this particular sensitivity analysis to see which ones uh, actually are robust to those different assumptions. And he went on to show how it how it could be important for both discovery in the metagenome and this Nature Communications paper, but also to, to try to look at robustness of findings in in the metagenome diabetes literature and plus biology in 2022. Here's an example of how you could use this: is in that particular paper is that. Um, showing different VOE structure for different exposures and phenotypes. For example, in, in plot E, uh, Braden took down all the uh, individual COVID positivity and looked at vitamin D uh, levels in, in blood and threw in all these different models to show that, in fact, depending on the type of model that you choose, you're going to get a negative and or a positive association all, all, all pretty simultaneously. So this is an association that would probably be less robust to study design, whereas something on the on the left-hand side, like calcium intake and femur density are probably more robust to different variable uh, selection procedures. So I'd say in conclusion, conclusion here that uh, I, I believe that uh, we need to address certain things like stability, multiplicity, correlation. Uh, but I think that with biobank samples like here, uh, um, like, like UK Biobank and, and, um, and, and the Kaduri Biobank, we can get to new biological measurements. And if some of those cohorts in here do have that biological uh, substrate, we could get to uh, uh, measure omics measure uh, to get to the biology as well there too. Um, and another approach might be to look at how the, we can harmonize across these cohorts to do synthesis um, uh, to assess stability as well. Thanks very much for all, all of your attention and our funding sources. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. T Dr. Patel. That was an awesome talk. Lots of information there, lots of opportunity, but lots of challenges uh, in, in, in the same. So um, with the remainder of our time today, we have a few more minutes to take some questions pertaining to Sharad's talk or questions that are somewhat broader that could be addressed to both of our speakers. Please feel free to add uh, questions to the Q&A box, um, or please raise your hand as well if you'd like to ask questions to the speakers. I, uh, I might um, pose a question uh, to start the discussion with Raja and Sharag. Uh, just thinking about the intersection of, of, of both, both of your talks, there, there's 
a huge need to pull to, together many data sets that are in different locations. You know, they've got different rules, uh, different formats, um, it, but we need to do this as Shirag was mentioning for the exposure, expose on wide associations to understand that. Raja, you, you mentioned a need for federation across data resources. Uh, so I, I'm just curious, are there good examples of uh, standards or structures that we could employ and encourage throughout the, the field that can help data exchange across platforms to help feed into the analytical analyses and tools that, that you all are, are mentioning today? Yeah, I can I can try to answer this particular question based on my experience uh, in other other fields. Uh, what is needed is that, for example, Shirag has several uh, students who have been working on these uh, different types of projects, and they have done a lot of pre-processing steps to make the data compatible and integrated so that they can run these experiments. And when they did those type of processing and data fusion, they probably didn't write it down or note it down, even in the paper, they don't mention it, how they did it. So capturing those things into an automated workflow, providing that workflow environment is needed, obviously, but if then we captured in an automated workflow, the next set of people who are coming in and would like to do a similar experiment, they can just run similar type of workflow with the new data probably, and then can be able to get to that. So you need to define that. And we have seen that in, at least in, in one particular field in hydrology, uh, where they had uh, um, um, people doing um, some sort of uh, uh, what do you call water, uh, uh, water flow and, uh, and soil moisture type of uh, 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 processing uh, modeling in the, for their hydrologic uh, modeling. And it takes a postdoc around more than eight to nine months to do the pre-processing before they can e even go to the modeling stage because they have to fuse multiple data coming from multiple sources. And one of the things we did that as, as part of our uh, Data Net Federation Consortium is provide them with a tool so that they can do those steps automatically. They, it takes a little bit of time because they have to write the programs and automate it into microservices and things like that. But once they have done it, they can just run it through that so the next postdoc who came in was able to pick it up and start running it within 15 days. So they didn't need to, uh, to do that another, another eight months of, of learning the thing, how to do that and things like that. And uh, with, with, with students coming in and going, I think Shirag probably has, this, has, that, has that particular problem of, of reteaching new students of how to do that and things like that. So that is where the ecosystem type of thing comes into play, uh, will be very helpful to to speed up many of these processes. Uh, I totally agree. So uh, one, uh, so to, to, to kind of get to um, a question that was just asked in, in the channel here too, is that um, the use of the, even the word uh, or the acronym conflicts with other commonly you know, used uh, acronyms out there like the epigenome wide association study. So I first, th I think that like we in the exposome field need to come to agreements about even things like acronyms, right? So, you know, and, and not overload existing acronyms out there in the bio, bio world, like the epigenome wide association study. So we might need a new acronym that others can, can, uh, can lean on. The second is um, to answer your question, also you answer your question, Chris, is that we, uh, Dr. Duncan, we also used, uh, you know, approaches in, that are already being developed in the in the biology world uh, or the genetics world. So, for example, uh, there have been standards, for example, mapping, you know, genotypes to particular places on the genome that we very much lean on to do our genetics analyses. And so, as uh, as 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 we we're saying, I think the same similar approaches need to be done for the exposome field. That is to say, you know, if I have a assay that is is being you know run on this particular instrument in you know this particular lab we need a way of kind of matching that somehow to another assay that's measuring something equivalent so that we could compare those results and i still think that that work has yet to be done um for the field to to accelerate um and to make stuff more re reproducible thank you dr patel 
Uh, we have, uh, we're running out of time, but we have one hand raised, uh, Hemet Tawari. Liz, could we give Hemet a, a chance? Yeah, so the one of the thing is, Chirag, it was both of you gave a really wonderful talk. My question is, uh, when you show your uh, heritability and uh, uh, the other index you showed, uh, the you just showed the estimate. You did not show the variance or a standard error because that actually matters much more in those situations. I mean, like I have seen the heritability estimates. I've been doing heritability since long, long time ago. So uh, those estimates are great, but if so, yeah, maybe you are you have in those papers. So I will look into it. Yeah, and please, course, please do. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead. go ahead. I, I completely agree with you that, you know, the we need to ensure that our, our samples are powered. And I think that's one yeah. reason why the biobanks have been so appealing, especially for geneticists. And I think maybe more so also for uh, for environmental epidemiologists is to get power for detection. Um, a, you might have noticed the the. I, I quickly glossed over the slide, but I did show the negative log 10 p values, which is a function of the standard error. And you'll see that many of them have very, very low uh, low p values. And we do report the standard errors in 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 the in the text. So any of the things that I showed you here are not going to have, you know, expansive standard errors that we cannot conclude anything at all. They are, you know, greater than one. So uh, and and many of so are are very strongly uh, strongly greater than that. But I totally agree that getting the sample sizes um, if for these studies is imperative, which makes something like here and biobanks that much more important. Thank you, Dr. Patel. So unfortunately, we're out of time today. I wish we had more time to discuss. But in closing, I want to sincerely thank both of our speakers for their excellent presentations and thoughtful discussions. I'd also like to take a moment to extend a special thank you to the organizers of the HERE Exposomics webinar series, Susan McRitchie, Dinesh Kumar Barupal, Liz Davis, Jessica Pecorino, Melanie Walker, Tracy Spangler, Barbara O'Brien, as well as the HERE Coordinating Center and the HERE Network. On behalf of the team, we sincerely thank all of the attendees for your attention and engagement today. But uh, before we sign off, one quick announcement. The next webinar in the HERE Exposomics webinar series will be on November 3rd from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Please join us. The topic will be systematic biological responses to environmental exposures, and we'll have presentations from Dr. Andrea Baccarelli and Dr. Lauren Petrick. So it's going to be some really good talks there. So please join us again on November 3rd at 3 p.m. And for more information on this series, including the recordings of each of the webinars, please visit hereprogram.org. With that, I'd like to say thank you again to our speakers. Thank you to everyone in the audience as well for joining us today. We'll see you in November.